Hey everybody, this is Heather with Young and Savvy Genealogist, and today I'm going to be continuing our Genetic Genealogy Simplified series. This is going to be part two of a multi-part series on the basics of genetic genealogy. In part one, we covered an introduction to the basic parts of the DNA double helix. We also talked about alleles and SNPs and centimorgans and their role in genetic genealogy. These are all really basic concepts that you'll want to be familiar with. If you're just getting started, definitely go back and check out part one to catch up with those concepts. We also talked about phasing. So if you are curious about whether or not you should have more than one person take a genealogy or a genetic uh, DNA test, you'll definitely want to check out phasing and why that's important. And all of that was covered in part one. In part two, we're going to be talking about a little bit more about those same concepts. But as they apply to chromosome browsers, we're going to go into the basics of a chromosome browser, what it looks like and how it works. We're going to talk about false matches, identical by descent versus identical by state. We're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about the matching criteria from different major testing companies. So to review, this is a DNA strand. These colors that you see in the middle, these colored rods, those are base pairs. Every genetic strand is made of this basic structure. You're going to have the base pairs in the middle, and the colors correspond to these nucleobases. DNA strands are made of these base pairs, and when these base pairs mutate, that is called a SNP. DNA matches are made of extended sections of these SNPs, of these mutations. So the way that we see that play out on a chromosome browser, you can see that uh, this is a match from GEDmatch.com. This is my match to another gentleman on that website. And he and I matched together on chromosome number six. And this blue section right here indicates a matching segment between me and this person. And if you look here in this white box, you can see that my match to this gentleman is 54.9 centimorgans long. This is a really, really good match. And I can judge that based on not only the length of the segment, but the number of SNPs and mutations that are on that segment. You really don't get something much more reliable than this. This is 54 centimorgans with over 17,000 SNPs. The minimum threshold that you want to be using is 7 centimorgans. Color coding that GEDmatch uses is a lot like a stoplight. And so these vertical lines all represent di uh, different base pairs on a chromosome segment. The red is where I have no match to this person. Whether it's on one side of my double helix or the other, I don't match them in any way. The yellow sections, you can see that where I match them, I have quite a bit of a yellow section, but you see them scattered throughout the rest of here too. This is a half match. On half of my DNA double helix, I match this person in these yellow sections. Wherever it is green, that is a full match. So on both sides of the double helix, I match this person. And you can see where I have matching, a uh, large matching segment to this man is where I have my largest green sections. On a chromosome browser, you can not only see where on the chromosome you match that person, but how you match them. And that's what makes these chromosome browsers so very, very useful and so very, very lovely. If you are an Ancestry DNA customer and you would like to see this type of information about the people that you match, I would encourage you to download your results from Ancestry DNA, that is completely free, and upload it to GEDmatch.com, which is also completely free. The thing you need to be aware of as you start to use a chromosome browser is that it is going to represent two types of relationships. I want to see matches where the reason that I'm matching this person on my DNA is because we share an ancestor. Those are the matches I want to find, and it's called identical by descent, or an IBD. I know that this person that I'm looking at right now is definitely an IBD. 
my Santa Morgan segment is long enough and I have enough snips there that there's no doubt in my mind that this is true. And so at this point, I'm able to reach out to this person. He's provided an email on JedMatch.com, so I'm able to email him and ask him about his family tree, about his pedigree, where he comes from, different surnames in his family. And hopefully as I'm able to do that as well, we're going to be able to piece together the ancestor that we descend from. Now, a helpful hint that will help you as you start to reach out and try to find these IBDs is you really want to have a version of your family tree where the only thing that you represent are biological relationships. So any type of step parents, any type of adoptions, any second, third, fourth, however many other marriages, you want to take those relationships out. Any type of uh, information that you send to another person needs to be about a biological relationship. Now for a false positive, where they come from, they're very common especially for people who descend from certain racial or ethnic groups. Racial and ethnic groups, especially those of African or Jewish descent, they have certain genetic material that repeats in their populations and because their populations are very small, it's very hard to tell whether that is indicative of a biological relationship or of their ethnic heritage. When someone is a match to you because of their racial or ethnic group and not because of a biological relationship, that is called being identical by state. As you compare notes with this person, you're not going to be able to find any sort of biological relationship. This is a genetic inheritance estimate chart and it's a really cool thing that I saw on a blog um, Kelly Wheaton over on Wheaton surname resources uh, she adapted this out of some information from another genetic genealogist and I really really liked it and I wanted to represent it here all of us are made up of a finite number of Morgan segments so as you go further back in your generations, these numbers are going to get smaller. And as you can see, as we get back to the 7th Centimorgan range, you're already dealing with 8 times great-grandparents. And as of right now, that is the absolute limit of what an autosomal DNA test can do. If you try to go back further than that, you're dealing with very unreliable information that we have not figured out how to analyze effectively yet. And that is something to keep in mind as we look at these testing thresholds of these different testing companies. I got this information off of ISOG, which is the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. It's a website that is kept and maintained almost like a, it's a Wikipedia for genetic genealogy. And so the information that you're going to find there is a reflection of all sorts of different levels of experience. You're going to find people who do this professionally who contribute to that to that site. You're going to find people who do this recreationally. You're going to find people who studied this in college and so they're spreading uh, new information and, and new best practices around on there. So it's a really good website to be familiar with if you intend to take an active interest in genetic genealogy. This is something that I got directly from their, re their website, and I can't vouch for the accuracy or the up-to-dateness on the information, so if you have better information, leave it in comments. But, as of right now, this is what they have posted on their website as the testing criteria for the major genealogy and genetic testing companies. So starting with 23andMe, this is the core of their matching strategy. Their minimum threshold that they use for the first segment that they find is 7 centimorgans and 700 snips. And when I say first segment, what is that referring to? The more related you are to somebody, the more likely it is that you're going to match that person on more than one chromosome or on the same chromosome more than once. What you'll see on a testing site like, or not a testing site, but on a matching website like GEDmatch, 
when you get your list of cousin matches, it's going to sort it by largest segment. So that's going to be your most reliable segment, but it's not necessarily going to be your only segment. Because I haven't had my parents or any of my grandparents tested yet, the most segments I've ever seen on any of my chromosomes is two. I match some of my matches twice on the same chromosome, or I match them on different chromosomes, but I have two segments to, to analyze. That first segment, you know, seven centimorgans and 700 SNPs is, is a really good threshold for that match. But you need to understand that 23andMe does not treat any additional segments with the same criteria. For any additional segments, this is the criteria that they're using. They're saying five centimorgans and 700 SNPs together for any additional segments that they find. Okay, so this could be on the same chromosome, this could be on a different chromosome, but just keep in mind that this, these are the thresholds that they're using for any additional segments. And so with using a limit like five centimorgans, you may start to find um, those people who are identical by state, but by having a threshold of 700 SNPs, that should help to counterbalance that pretty well. And so 23andMe, in my, in my opinion, in my estimation, uses really good matching standards. I'm really pleased with those numbers. As you go over to Family Tree DNA, you're going to find a very different image of what is happening. Their first segments are analyzed with a standard of 7.69 centimorgans, so almost eight centimorgans, and they lower the SNP count by a bit, they'll they'll go to 500 SNPs as being their bare minimum. Um, there will still be uh, le very legitimate matches that come in at the six uh, between 500 and 700 SNPs, and pairing it together with a longer no a longer centimorgan segment will help to counterbalance that. So what you are really starting to see here is that these two numbers always go together. They're like two wheels on a bicycle. You can't analyze the centimorgan segment without analyzing the SNPs. These two numbers always have to go together because it's what makes each of them more reliable. That's what they do for the first segment. And what they do for this any additional segments they find, I really kind of question this. For any other segment that they find, they will add them all together and if the information is greater than 20 centimorgans, they will consider all of that together as one larger match. And included in that measurement are going to be shorter matching segments, including segments between one and seven centimorgans. And I really would have a bone to pick with that type of analysis because the technology to analyze any segment smaller than five centim centimorgans does not exist. Basing my matches based on a sort of genetic context in order to legitimize these smaller segments, that is not a good practice in, in my opinion. When you do that, you are opening yourself up to having more inaccurate matches, you're, you're opening yourself up to especially more IBS segments, which for someone like me, who is descended by both African and Jewish populations, this is not something that would be particularly helpful to me. This is going to lead me down a lot of really false rabbit holes, and that's not an experience that I want. Ancestry DNA, of course, has to be the oddball out. And even though this chart says that they use a minimum of five centimorgans for their segments and, and no estimation whatsoever of SNPs, as I've done some research, I've discovered that SNPs and centimorgans aren't even something that they necessarily use. They use a criteria that is based much more on megabase pairs. They do a physical measurement based on those base pairs. So they're, they're measuring it from base pair to base pair. And that could be a huge part of the reason why they don't give us a chromosome browser. Because um, the way that they analyze the data and the way that they communicate it to people is so vastly different from the rest of the genetic genealogy community that you know, I for one can't even imagine what this would look like. 
and where I kind of got that information about the mega base pairs from. That is from a blog post that CC Moore did based on her conversation with Ken Kahini, who is from Ancestry DNA. So if you want to learn more about Ancestry DNA and their whole spiel with how they do matching and their mentality behind that, I'm going to include a link to CC Moore's post from her blog on that subject. My point of bringing up the stuff from the from the testing companies is because different standards for matching will lead to different match lists. If you test with all three of these companies and you have cousins that test with all three of these companies, you they may or may not show up in your list based on how these companies do their their matching. So if I test on 23andMe and I test on Ancestry DNA, there will be cousins that will show up in those lists and won't show up in those lists. And it's all based on their standards for what they consider to be a match. Understand that if you get a test from one of the, from one of these companies and upload it to jedmatch.com, to Jed it's going to be the easiest way to circumvent a lot of these issues. Because you're going to be able to establish for yourself a, a matching standard. So for me, I can decide what my matching standard is going to be. I'm going to decide what I think a good match is. And by using tools like jedmatch.com, that's the way it empowers a user. You're going to be able to decide that for yourself. That concludes our series for right now. Definitely be sure to visit back with us again because next time I'm going to be talking about a much more thorough introduction to jedmatch.com. As you can tell, I'm a huge fan of their services. I am not a representative of them whatsoever. I am just a very happy user of that website. I am going to encourage everyone that I can to use it. And in order to facilitate that, I'm going to talk about the different admixtures that they provide, how to use the one-to-many tools, and the one-to-one -one analysis, which is a bit more of what you saw today. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check back as I cover more of that information. And definitely be sure that you visit with us over on our blog at youngandsavvygenealogists.blogspot.com. You can follow us on Twitter at YSGenealogists. And be sure to visit us on YouTube and like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for coming to visit with us, and we hope to see you again.